Well, good morning. We are uh, starting a new series we're calling The Table, uh, and it's all about uh, tables and the, the thing around it. We're kind of getting ready for Thanksgiving. This is our uh, Thanksgiving uh, kind of sermon series that we, we do. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you think about Thanksgiving, what do you think about? Turkey, yeah. That, that's just the first thing I think about, too. When I, you know, it's, oops, sorry. My thing's going crazy here. Uh, when I think about uh, turkeys, the symbol I always think about is the turkey, you know, the brown, and it's got all the stuff and all the fixins, you know, and you can smell it, and, and you got the, the cranberries, and, you got, and you're all going to be hungry and not pay attention to me here in a minute, so maybe better stop there. But, you know, as, as much as growing up, I always thought of that as the symbol, um, you know, things change. I, when I was in seminary, we became really good friends, really, really good friends uh, with some people. Um, and they, he, he was full blood, is full blood Italian. I mean, he's like as Italian as it gets. And so they invited us over for Thanksgiving. First, we invited them over for one. The next year, they invited us over. And I kind of walk into the house, and I'm looking for the turkey. And I'm not seeing no turkey. I didn't know this. Italians have lasagna for Thanksgiving. I think that's sacrilege, isn't it? <laughs> it turns out we live in a diverse world, amen? People do all kinds of things. That's just my North American kind of white guy thing that thinks about turkeys, you know? It's all right, you know? Um, and so we learned, we, we compromised, and so for like years and years after that, we would share Thanksgiving together, and we always had turkey and lasagna. <laughs> Take your choice, whichever one you wanted. Uh, and so it just occurred to me that in some ways the turkey isn't that great a symbol. It works for a certain number of people, but it doesn't work for a lot of people. But there is a symbol at Thanksgiving that I think is really, really powerful. And as it turns out, it's, it's a big old bi bah, biblical one. Uh, and it's the table. You know, the table is the thing that goes through all the different, whatever, whatever culture you come from, there are very few cultures that don't eat at some sort uh, of table. And tables come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and, and colors. And, you know, you got this one here. You couldn't get many people around it, you know. Uh, but a lot of you have dining room tables. How many have dining room tables of, of some sort? Yeah. Um, we have a dining room table. In fact, the dining room table has kind of been a, a big deal for us because um, all of our years uh, of marriage, uh, the best we ever had was we bought kind of an old used one at a second-hand store, a dining room table, and we covered it so people wouldn't see how ugly it was, uh, you know, all, all through those years. And then, you know, a few years ago, we, we kind of looked at ourselves and said, you know, in this stage of life, we might, we'd like a nice dining table. I say we. Mostly Jody said, we're going to get a nice dining table, you know. <laughs> I'm tired of that old one, you know. And so, so we went out, and she looked and looked and looked, and finally we bought ourselves a nice, I mean a nice dining room table. It's long. You put a lot of people around it. You can put uh, extensions on the end of it. I've never seen anything like that before. So you can really long, you know. So you can put a lot, a lot of people around it. Uh, translate that to grandkids. You can put grandkids around it, you know. <laughs> Lots of grandkids. It's kind of my statement of faith that someday I'll have grandkids as we bought a big table. It's like, okay, Lord, I'm claiming it here. And, and, and so we, we love it, and it's beautiful, and, and it is where we sit around and we spend time uh, together as families, because that, that's kind of what, what tables are all about. It's all about uh, people we have things in common with, people we connect with. It's, it's a gathering place. Isn't the table that? I mean, other than the junk that lands on it, you know, but, but we clear it off, and it's a gathering place for people. It's, it's a place where we share about life. When our kids were little, we'd always share at the dinner table. What'd you do in school? And Janet would talk for half an hour, and Kevin would say, stuff. You know? So it was a place where I got stuff out of him. It's a place where we're relaxed, as a general rule. There's just something about sharing a meal that makes us all relax a little bit. It, it's, a, it's a satisfying place. It satisfies our, our physical hunger and in many ways our emotional, spiritual, soul hunger for connection with one another, renewal, and laughter. We've laughed a lot around at tables over the years. It's a, it's a place for tears. I've cried with people and prayed with people at, at tables. It's a place to share life, to break bread together. It's also a place where my son and y'all usually beats me at some sort of card game, but... Uh, it's, just, it's a building relationships kind of a place. And so we all have these things. And so for the next couple of weeks, we're going to think a lot about the table. The, the table in our home. I hope you gather people you love around the table in your home. But we also want to think almost metaphorically about the table as the people that are important in, in our lives. Um, and so 
Jesus very often used tables to teach about the kingdom of God. I kind of got onto this and started looking around. There are tables everywhere. Uh, it's it's kind of like the, 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 the item that photobombs the stories about Jesus. There's a table in some place. And one of the ones that really kind of surprised me, uh, so if you've been raised in the church, you kind of remember the story of Jesus uh, be, having his feet anointed with oil, preparing him for crucifixion. And one of the little things that picks up that he was at a table when that happened. Uh, because in the ancient world, the tables were a little different. Uh, they, they, were, they were small. They were low to the ground. Uh, most of you have big tables, right? You sit up in chairs. But they were, these were low to the ground. And you would tend to lean in on your elbow and then the table. And then your feet would go out. And you could put a lot of people that way. And so, so with his feet out, it made it very convenient for her to come up and, and take his feet and begin to, begin to put the oil on there. You couldn't do that with a modern table, man. You'd be climbing underneath the table to do it. It'd be kind of embarrassing, you know? And, and same thing with, with um, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. They would have been leaning at a table and their feet would have been out. And so it, it kind of made it able for that. There's, a, there's another story, you know, the washing of, of the feet happens at, at a table. Um, Mary and Martha, you remember the story about Mary and Martha? Mary, Martha was in the kitchen getting things, everything ready. And it's like she finally got frustrated because Mary was at the table with Jesus and the disciples. And as it, as it turns out, Jesus said, by the way, Martha, you should be at the table too, you know? Somebody will get the dishes done sometime. Don't worry about that. That's what I tell my wife all the time. She doesn't buy it. But, you know, it's so, the, the, the table, the, the Lord's Supper, this thing that we celebrate, this most ancient practice of the Christian church. Happened at a table. In fact, we have this little table that we kind of put the elements on when we, we do communion, you know. And I, I thought, yeah, there's a part of me that just wants to put a giant table down here and put chairs around it. And make you all come down and sit at the table and take communion. And then the next group would go, but that would take all day long, so we don't do that. But there, there's something about, about this. In fact, tables and sharing tables was a big deal in their culture. Jesus used a table in subversive ways in his environment. He would do crazy stuff. Like saying to Zacchaeus, that sinner, great sinner, I'm coming to your house to eat, Zacchaeus. Get some food on the table, dude. That's kind of the modern translation. Get ready, because I'm coming to your house for dinner. And, and all kinds of tax collectors. He was accused of, you're, you're, you're at a table with tax collectors. Again, Jesus, you're hanging out with the wrong crowd. Not only did he hang out with that crowd, he also hanged out. He also hanged out. He also hung out. Uh, <laughs> all the school teachers were like, oh, <laughs> He also hung out with, with, with rich and powerful people, with the, the Pharisees and the, the, the leaders of, of the community. In fact, the story we're going to look at in a, bit, a little bit is all about hanging out with those people. He even said that the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet. Where do you eat at a wedding banquet? On a table. I'm telling you, tables are photobombing Jesus' stories all the time. Okay, And, and so um, the, the table literally in Scripture is almost a sacred space. It's a place where spiritual things happen. It's a place where we meet with God and we meet with others. It's a place for family, for family. We, we meet around that, that table. And in the ancient culture, there was kind of a, a way of going about that. And, and um, the, the, the head of the family, the father, although he may have been a grandfather, there may have been several generations, would sit at the head of the table. In fact, your rank was determined kind of by where you sat at the table. There's a story about Jesus uh, telling people to move up and move down in, in the rank. And, and, and there's this, this wonderful image in, in this that, okay, it's a little sexist, but you've got to understand that, that, that day and age. But there's this wonderful image of this loving father with, with his family gathered around him. And he is the provider of the meal and the protector of the family. Loved by everyone, you know, and the one that loves his family and cares for his family and lays down his family and worked hard for his family and provides for his family. And it's, a, it's a great image for us. And, and it's also kind of a reminder for us that, that for us, Jesus is the head of our table, amen? amen? Jesus is the one that provides. It, it means everything, this, this breaking together as we, we gather as family. And, and so let, let me ask you this question. Is God the head of your family? I, I know you go to church. Y'all go to church. Kind of by definition, you're here this morning, you know. But there's a difference between religious practice and, and really making God head of your family. The one that we all look to in this. 
And we have this, sometimes people get hung up on, well, the man's the head of the family. Well, that was a little different with multiple cultures. You could be a grown man and still your father was the head of the, the family. And that's kind of the model we think about in all of that. And there's some, there's some great, great parts to this idea of this, this loving father that cares for you. And can, can I just tell you something, especially guys here? Your family goes better when God's the head of your family. Amen. It does. Your, your marriage goes better when God's the head of your family. And, and this is speaking from experience. The Lord's got me down on the floor and twisted my arm up be, between my back many a time about my marriage, you know? And he never agrees with me. <sighs> your work will go better if God's the head of your family. Your, your, all of your relationships go better if God is the, the head of your family. There's something powerful. And we are reminded of that every time we come to the communion table. You are coming to the Father's, your heavenly Father's table. You are not the head. He is the head. Amen? It's like in the church. He is the head. I'm not the head. I know I have to sign the documents, but Christ is head of the church, and I serve at his pleasure and at his direction. That's the way God has wired our world. But there was something unique in that, that ancient culture where you had the, the father, the grandfatherly, often the very elderly one that was kind of the head that everyone uh, looked to in, in all of that. And, and there was this sense of gratitude that would happen for your, your father, your grandfather that, that, that provided. There was a, a sense of perspective that you were a part of something bigger than yourself, a, a, an awareness of the contribution of others to your life because you, you lived in family. There's this thing that happens for us because we live in such isolation with one another that we can begin to think that it's all about us. It ain't all about us. It's all about the kingdom of God and God's family and we're a, we're a part of that. And everything comes from God's hand, amen? amen? Every once in a while I'll jump into hearing someone that, that talks, well, I'm a self-made man. And I, and I understand what they're saying about that, you know? But sometimes they kind of get way off down that road. Well, I, nobody ever gave me anything and I did it all myself and I am, I'm damn what I am. And I, I just want to say, you know, if you'd been born to peasants in Haiti, do you still think you'd be a millionaire? Just the very fact that God let you be born in this place is a gift from God. Amen? It, 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 all, it all comes uh, from, from Him in so many ways. And in fact, this idea of gratitude is just super important in Scripture, of understanding that there's more to this. In the Old Testament alone, the word for thanksgiving appears over 150 times. Just in the Old Testament. You, know, you think about all that crazy war and things going on, you think it'd all be dark, and it's not. 150 times we're, we're instructed or the people are giving thanks and, and praise to God. And so I, I want us to look at Luke uh, chapter 14 uh, this morning. If you have your Bibles um, or on your phones or on the app uh, in the, from the, the church, you can find them all over there. There are three uh, stories there, um, and they're all about tables in, in Luke 14. So it's kind of interesting when you get a whole big section that kind of circulates that. The first one is, a, is about uh, Jesus being... He's at the home. He's sharing a meal with a, a high-ranking religious figure. Um, and on the periphery uh, of the story, there, there's some people that, that have some brokenness. They need healing, physical healing, and it's the Sabbath. And so very strict rules about what you can do on the Sabbath. And Jesus does this radically crazy thing. He heals somebody on the Sabbath. You know, and the people like me that have been to seminary were not very happy about that because we got rules against this thing, you know. And so there's kind of a conflict around this meal when, when they're all munching down and eating and having overabundance that Jesus would dare go and actually heal somebody, you know? And then the second one is a, is a wedding feast, and it's, it's, you know, giant kind of deal, and, and the story is all about self-importance and where your rank was. He says, sit at the bottom of the table so that they can move you up rather than being at the top of the table and having to be moved down. And then, and then the third one is what we call the great banquet. Uh, and I, I want to read parts of this to you, and I want to do parts on the screen of this. So we're going to go back and forth. And, and I want to read this to you because Scripture was written before printing presses and photocopiers, right? You understand that? When, when people were writing in the ancient world, there weren't very many people that could read, and there wasn't very much material to read. And so it was, they wrote in such a way that it was intended that people would listen to it, that one of the people who would, could read would read it to the congregation, and they, they would hear. And, and because they didn't have TV sets, and screens and all that. So they had good imaginations. They were very good at kind of catching that all. And so I want you to turn on your sanctified imagination right now, okay? And close your eyes. Maybe some of you need to close your eyes. I'll have pictures up here. But, but close your eyes and, and just imagine yourself. I, I'm just, by, by the, the power vested in me as a preacher, I make you all Jews in the first century right now, okay? And, and so imagine yourself there. Um, 
and uh, he, he begins to, to tell this story. It begins in verse 12. Let me just kind of read part of this and turn the images on. Think about images. He said also to the man who invited him, this is Jesus, he is now speaking to the head of the banquet. There's all kinds of people around. There's celebration. These are all really, really important people, and Jesus is a part of it. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. Okay, he just wiped out everybody you normally invite to one of these things. He just wipes them all out. And then he says, why? Lest they also invite you in return and you are repaid. Now you've got to understand that big, big things like this were how you connected with the right people. Today we call it networking. Okay, this is how you did it in the ancient world. So all of a sudden this guy's going, okay, I can't invite any of the people I want and I can't do what it is I want to do out of this. And then he goes on to give him further. Some, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, uh, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will re be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now you have to understand, this is an incredibly awkward moment in this place. Right in the middle of this party, Jesus says to these high-ranking officials, you're doing this all wrong. Everything you want out of this, you shouldn't get out of this. The, 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 the connections and the status and all of that, you should abandon all of that, and you should invite in people that actually need to eat, and people that are on the margins of society, and people that, that don't count very much uh, in this place. And, and if you do that, then your reward won't be the reward of good networking, but your reward will be in the kingdom of heaven. Your reward, reward will be an eternal reward. And you can just feel the awkwardness in the room at this point, right? Have you ever, ever been to that party where somebody says something and it goes silent, you know? That, that's exactly what's going on right in this moment. Everybody's like, awkward, okay? It's in verse 15, and it, it goes on. Uh, sorry. Verse 15 says, when one of those who uh, reclined at table with him heard these things, okay, he's going, oh, and everybody's quiet. He said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And you all think immediately, wow, that's a really spiritual thing to say in the middle of all of this. What you probably don't know is that was actually a very common thing for people to say in their time. It was kind of a version of amen, right? So here's what's going on. Jesus says this thing that's very insulting to everybody there. He says it directly to the host of the party, right? And then there's this like, oh, and this guy goes, amen, let's eat, <laughs> Trying to change the subject, move, move past this, you know. And he thought he was going to kind of outfox Jesus and say, okay, let's, let's move on. Let's don't talk about this, this any, anymore. The kingdom of God is at hand. But, but trying to outfox Jesus is always a bad idea. It just doesn't work very well. So, so turn your imaginations back on, and, and now, now Jesus is going to give a reply. He probably knew this guy would say this. Verse 16, he says, but he said to him, this is Jesus, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And can't you see everybody going, oh, no, he's going to go further, okay? And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all began to make excuses. The first one said, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. This is pretty insulting in their culture, okay? And another said, I bought five yoke, five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I can't come. Yeah, I don't know why that one says that. It got me. I, got, I know the other two, but that one's like, I don't know. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Now, a couple of things before we move on I want to say in that. Number one, we know that this is already a rich man because he's throwing a big banquet. He is inviting rich people because these are people that own land, that somebody could go out and buy a piece of property. Uh, it, it, people that could buy five yoke of ox, that's like buying a giant monster truck, guys, for your work. Uh, rich people that, that, that do that in all this. So this is rich people uh, inviting uh, rich people in the midst of this. And these are flimsy excuses. Even in their culture, these are flimsy excuses. I mean, think about it for just a second. Who buys a piece of property without actually going and looking at it? 
It might be a swamp if you're doing it in Washington. You wouldn't know. You go check it out, you know? Who buys a giant expensive truck for your business without actually going and test driving it? Nobody does that. That would be irresponsible. And so these are very, very flimsy excuses that, that he's kind of passing off uh, to, in this. And, and I, again, I don't know what the wife thing is. I, I just leave that alone because I'll get in trouble. So um, <laughs> I may get in trouble anyway for that one. But <laughs> so, so in the ancient culture, you need to understand these banquets were super, super important to your social status in all of this. And so when people begin to make excuses like this, it's really a problem. And it's even more so than you'd probably think because in the ancient world, there was usually a two-step invitation. The first one was they would send an invitation to these people and they would reply, yes, I'm going to come to your banquet. And then when everything was prepared, then a servant would go and say, hey, we're ready to eat right? So these people have already said yes to the banquet, and now they're saying no to the banquet and giving flimsy excuses. And this is a, this is a big deal. In the ancient world, you know, they all cooked from scratch, and they cooked in stone, so they would have been preparing, like, way in advance, and they didn't have refrigeration. refrigeration. <laughs> so the way you kept your meat from going bad was it was alive this morning, okay? So th get the picture. This is a, a big deal, and, and these are hugely uh, in insulting, and the message they're sending is you're, you're not important enough for us. You're not important enough for us to, 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 to you know, interrupt our schedules uh, in, in all of this. And so there's this, kind of this giant insult going on. Uh, and, and, and it's not that the things that they were doing were bad. It was good stuff. Buying property is a good thing. Buying a new truck for your business, that, that's, that's a good thing. Taking care of your wife, always a good thing. Did I get myself out of a little Dutch here, dear? <laughs> Somewhere there. So, it, 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 but, but ultimately, here's what the issue is. They missed the great banquet because the busyness of life crowded it out. The busyness of life. Does that sound like the lives we live today? I don't know about you, but I feel like I am going a thousand miles all the time. And don't misunderstand, I'm ADHD. I kind of live on that, man. It's like, go, 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 go. Until somebody adds one thing too many and I miss the corner and it all falls apart. And then I start missing stuff and it, it's just, it's hard. There's... We live in a world where there is a tension between the urgent and the important. And we struggle with this. We, we struggle with this and there's a, a tendency of the urgent to push the important out of the picture. To, to push it off the, the calendar. Because, because the urgent, the urgent, we, we have alarms in our phones to make sure we get the urgent taken care of. Amen? How many of you have alarms in your phone? Am I the only one that needs those, man? They go off all the time. And then I find myself irritated with the alarm that I myself set. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. But, but the really important stuff, often that's the stuff you think, well, a, a little later. Ne next time, uh, you know, dear, I'm going to be home late tonight, but... but I'll come a little home early tomorrow night. One of the little lies we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better about the urgent in our lives. And so I, I just, I just want to say to you this. Never lose sight of the enormous privilege of gathering around God's table. Never lose sight of how important this is. Make room, uh, make time for, for the important in your life, for, for the kingdom of God, for, for things spiritual. It's just really easy for those to slide away, so much so that Jesus told this whole parable about this in this banquet. You see, I'm persuaded that evil doesn't have to destroy us. It just has to make us too busy for God. And that's the danger that scares me. Because, because the frontal attack, man, I'll take that on. It's like, I'm going to fight for God. But it's the one that just pulling me away and pulling me away and pulling me away and pulling me away. One of the saddest things about my job is that when people come to the end of their marriage, they often will come visit me. And sometimes people come early enough that they're really looking for help, but in, I don't think it's happened to anybody in here, but, but sometimes they're really mostly coming to tell me that, their marriage has come to an end. And very often, and for some reason it's especially the guys, so pay attention guys, but far more often than I like, I have a guy sitting there going, I don't know what happened. I don't know how we got here. I don't know. And then I probe into it and he's got a great business. He just was never at home. 
the, the urgent, the stuff in life. And, and she was giving him singles. We need, we need more time together, dear. You need to spend more time with the children. We've got to have a date night. We've got to, yeah, 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 next time, next week, next month. Some of you with children, you're in a stage of life where the days are long, but the years are short. And you'll put it off, and you'll put it off, and all of a sudden they're gone. The urgent got in the way of the important. And I'm going to meddle just a little bit here, okay? You love your pastor? <laughs> I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> I have known guys that have actually changed their job because of this. Because they had a job that consumed them and they had no time for their wife and for their family. Here's what I would say if you're in that situation. I'm not saying you've got to change your job, but I'm saying be really careful with this. Because when you get to the end of your life, nobody says, I wish I'd spent more time at work. Lots of people say, I wish I'd spent more time with my family. And you've got to find that balance. And I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to say that's what you need to do, but I am telling you when you get to the end of your life, it's your family that, that will be be there, not your job. Amen. The urgent and, and, and the important. Don't lose sight of the enormous privilege of, of gathering around God's table. Okay? So the story continues. Uh, then the master of the house became angry. Okay? Obviously, he's ticked about this. And said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring the poor and crippled and blind and lame. This is a major social faux pas. You do not invite those people to your banquets. Because you become who you associate with in all of this. And here's the good news. This is us. This is the regular folk. This is the normal people, you know, like you and me. Don't look at me like that. There is no one here that King Five is going to run a special when you die, okay? We're just regular folk. The, the normal run-of-the-mill life together sort of people that, that live. We're, we're the, often the invisible people. You go, we're the dregs of society. <laughs> Nobody says amen to that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just, I'm just kidding you. We're just trying to make a point. But I, I, here's what I want you to know. God loves regular people like you and me. He loves messy people. He loves broken people. He even loves ADHD people, which my wife tells me is not easy, by the way. He loves OCD people. He, he loves awkward people. He loves people like you and me. He loves people in recovery. He loves people with secrets. God loves you. He knows all about you. So then there's an interesting thing that came. Verse 22 says, um, and the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And I don't even know where to go with this. I'm just going to share with you this because I think this is so cool. This indicates that the servant knew the, the master's heart so well that he went out and invited these dregs of society into the banquet without even asking him. Now, in the ancient world, that would have been a major faux pas because, number one, you did not do that, and you certainly would not do that without asking the master. But this speaks to the wonderful love of the master's heart that the servant knew if we can't fill it up with the people we're supposed to, then we're going to just fill it up with the other people. So I just think that's really cool in this story. It's one of those little hymn, hidden gems about, about our, our Heavenly Father that his, fathers, his followers know him so well that they, they just know that he loves those other kind of people. So the story goes on, and the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. So this is even a lower class of people here that's being talked about. So the, blame, uh, the poor and the lame and the blind, all of those were kind of the city folk, but they, they were typically folk that had family that was around them. So even though they couldn't really make a big living, they would still be a part of the, the larger family. They wouldn't be homeless. Uh, they would have a meal at night, but they, they just couldn't make their, their contribution to the family, but they, they had a, a supporting, loving family. Aren't you thankful for supporting, loving families? Okay? If you've ever been in a bad spot, you should be thankful for this. But these people are actually the homeless of that community. They typically lived outside. That's why I said go out into the highways and hedges, and the homeless in that time would actually sleep next to the hedge of the road because it provided a little bit of break from whatever wind there was, a little bit of, you know, they could be back there where people wouldn't see them. And so now he's going out to the, to the very lowest of the, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. God wants no empty chairs at his banquet. 
He, he wants everyone there. And I, I love that passage until a friend of mine talked to me about it. And my, my friend is pastoring a church that's kind of exploding with growth. And he said to me, he said, Craig, empty pews in the church are a serious thing. Because God wants no empty chairs at his banquet. Run the whole story for me. The, 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 what, if, what if the story isn't so much about the kingdom of heaven? What if the story is directed to us? That we live in a world where there's all kinds of people that are hedges and highways and poor and broken and lame and all kinds of people that don't fit the standard. And he's saying, go out and bring them in. In fact, the word compel here is kind of an interesting one. We, when we think of it, we think of force, right? We compel someone. A police officer compels you to do something. But the, the original Greek word, although it has a, a bit of that to it, it actually is, is more the idea of do whatever it takes. This is kind of him saying to them, I, I, I don't care what it takes to get these people in here. Get them in here. Try to persuade them. Try to talk them into it. Bribe them if you have to. Do whatever it takes to get them to come in. And so there's this interesting picture uh, in, in all of this, this idea that we go out and we bring them in no matter what it takes. Look at the empty parts in this chair. Now, we could put all our services together and we'd have more people than we could fit in here. But maybe it's good for us to be reminded that there are not supposed to be any empty chairs at God's banquet. Amen? You know what I find particularly disturbing? I, I, I was at a um, conference a little while ago that was kind of talking about this sort of things, and, and they told us, they told us, oops, Get this back here. Uh, they, they told us this. In the last year, only 2% of Christians have invited somebody to church. Go out in the hedges and get everybody and compel them and bring them in that there might not be any empty seats, that my house might be filled. So let me say this. The kingdom of God as banquet is much more about now, is as much about now as later. I always grew up thinking this would be a story about what heaven's going to be like. There's going to be a great banquet. Really? I'm looking forward to that personally. Okay? There's going to be a great banquet. We are all going to gather. We're going to be in heaven together. I'm going to dance before the Lord and embarrass you all. <laughs> You're all going to be going, yes, that was my pastor when I was on earth. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know? Now, I'm pretty sure at the banquet in heaven, you can eat anything you want, and it's all zero calories. It's just that you don't put on any weight. That, you know, that's, that's just got to be the, the way it, it is. And that's the way I thought about this story. But in fact, this story is as much about now. It's as much about how we live. In fact, when God uses the kingdom, when Jesus used the kingdom of God, it almost always refers to both then and now. There's something coming, but there's something you need to do uh, in, in this life. That, that we should be so grateful for what God has done that, that, that we go out and invite. In, in fact, I would offer that the kingdom of God's banquet is all about gratefulness. It's all about thanking God for what he's done. It's all about celebration of what God has done. You ever been to a really, really good party? Then if you want to admit it, you're like, uh, you might ask me about that one. And that was when I was in college, and so, you know. If you've ever been to a really great banquet, this is going to be better than that one. This is going to be the greatest one. And yet there's this strange image where you, you kind of contrast and compare the, the, the ones that had everything, that, that didn't need anything. They didn't want to go to the banquet, but the ones that had nothing, they wanted to go to the banquet. They were grateful for the invitation to come. Can't you imagine what it was like for them after that? The homeless guy that, that comes back from the banquet and the guy that missed it because he was off, he's like, you're not going to believe where I was at. I was up at the mansion. I just went to a great banquet at the mansion. The other homeless guy's gone, no way, you know, because that, that, that just don't happen in that society. You know, can you imagine? They probably talked about it for the rest of their life. You know, can you imagine the grandchildren of some of these people that got into this banquet? You know, like, oh, no, grandpa's telling the banquet story again, you know. He tells it every time. We're not sure whether it's true or not, but, but there it is. You, you see, gratitude is full, grateful is full of gratitude. I, I love the word grateful. Say grateful. grateful. Yeah, it's full and overflowing. Uh, it, it's an important part of it. And, 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 you know, like I said, 150 times in the Old Testament, the word thanksgiving is mentioned in some sort of way. And it's a part of who we are, and it's a common part of these banquets that there's gratitude for what God has done. And so I think it's really important that we learn how to be grateful. So let me give you a kind of a couple things here. Gratefulness comes from mindfulness of God's blessing in our lives. 
great fullness comes from mindfulness of God's blessing in our lives. It comes to paying attention to all the things that God has put in, in our lives. It was easy for a poor or a crippled or a blind or a lame person to be grateful because they saw that. That filled up the screen. They, were, they gushed about it. It was such a big deal. And for us, we have so, so much that it's easy for us to get focused on the little bit we don't have. Honestly, if you live in America, you have lots, lots, lots of stuff. We're, we're so blessed. And, and, and so mindfulness, being aware, awareness, the consciousness of all that God has done for you. God has done so much for you. Amen? Whatever he's given, there's just so much. So let me ask this question. How full is your gratitude tank this morning? How many of you know how full your gas tank is when you pulled in? I mean, yeah, a bunch of you probably looked at it. You know, hey, hey, I, we're not even aware of how full our grateful tank is in all of this. But we, we pay so much attention to our, to our gas tank. We, I got a new car a while back, new to me car. And, and uh, um, it, it actually has a, a light that comes on when your gas gets low, you know, which is like so cool. Sorry, I was driving an old car before this came. And, and so, so the, the light comes on, you know, and, and, and I'm thinking, oh, that's cool, but I always let it get way down there because I'm ADHD. I can never take time to stop and get gas, right, you know? And so it gets down to E, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to pay attention to this. And then I noticed that it also has a little thing that tells you, like, how many more miles you got left on that particular tank, right, you know? So I'm thinking, oh, that's cool. I can go till it's, like, really close because it's only six miles between here and home, right? And there's a gas station. It's kind of expensive. Don't like to buy gas there. But, but, but I'll be fine. And so it's going down and it's going down. And it's down to, the like, like 20 miles left, right? You know, which is not a, a very much, much gas. And I'm thinking, cool, man. I can do two or three trips more back, back and forth, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't think real clearly about these things. But I, I leave here and I'm starting to head back towards home. And all of a sudden, it doesn't say 20 miles left. It says... Stop now for gas in red. I'm like, ah! <laughs> you know? That wasn't nice, you know? Because <laughs> I'm sure they're probably not that accurate, but I paid a lot of attention to that. <laughs> I stopped and paid expensive, bought expensive gas. How's the meter on the fullness of your gratitude to God? Because let me tell you, in the grand scheme of things, that'll change your life way more than the gas tank. I mean, you run out of gas, that changes your life for a little while, but it irritates a lot. But how, how, how full is that? Or is your life too busy to think about that? See, gratitude drives out a lot of other negative stuff in our lives. When we focus on God and we give thanks, there's just something that, about that that drives it out. So let me ask you, who's around your banquet table? Not, not just your personal one, but, but, but your physical one, but the, the larger one. So close your eyes for just a minute. I know we're just out of time here. But just a minute, imagine the people that you are thankful for, that you are grateful for, full of gratitude. Who's around your table? A lot of you have great kids. I know you see their flaws, but you really do have good kids because I've seen the kids that aren't good. You, you have great grandkids. Well, grandkids that are great, and some of you have got great grandkids. That's a, that's a cool thing. So a spouse that loves you, you should give thanks for that every day. I talked about this in the last two services. We have at least three couples in this church that have been married 62 years. Yeah. I love being a part of a community when we say, until death us depart, we really mean it. Amen. Amen. Part of that. Uh, if your parents are still alive, if they're still at your table, you should give thanks for that. Mine are all in heaven, including my sister. I'm the last of my family. Your friends... Your, your family, who's around your table, all of the people that, that matter in, in your life. Give thanks. Let their presence fill you up with gratitude to God because ultimately the table is a sacred trust. It's a holy moment. It, it, it's the thing that, that matters more than, than anything else, this sharing together and loving each other. Don't let the urgent crowd out the important in your life. And you say, it's not as simple, it's complex. I, I get that, I get that, I get that. But I want to challenge you to think carefully about this because you see, ultimately, there are only two things that are important, and that's our Heavenly Father and the people at the table, amen? amen. Only two things that are really important. Everything else will burn, everything else will be gone, but those two things matter for eternity. 
And so as we begin this Thanksgiving season, if our, if our musicians could come, we're going to sing a, a great song. We're going to worship the Lord in giving. I want to challenge you this week to reevaluate the balance between the urgent and the important in your life. Don't go quiet on me like that. To reevaluate the urgent and the important. Because the one thing you can never redo is time. I mean, you can do again, but the time is gone. And it's such an important thing. Fill your heart. Get great full. Get full, full, get full up with gratitude to God. Amen? Amen? And next week we're going to talk about Psalm 100, which will be holy party. So come back. Invite someone. Fill up the seats so that the table is, is, is full. Let me, let me pray for you. Father God, thank you for these good people. Father, thank you uh, that, that you, you put in our heart a desire to give our, our lives to that which is important in our lives. But, but Father, we confess that in our world there's, there's a lot of urgent. And so help us, Father, to, to, to find that balance, the urgent, the things that need to be done, but, but the important, the things that, that really, really matter. Father, I, I pray that you'd make us a church that, that has a clear vision of what's really important and we give our energy to that. Thank you, Father, for the, the good and generous people that are a part of this church. Father, I am thankful, I am grateful for the people that are so generous financially in this church, Father, and in so many other ways, for the ones that volunteer for all that's done. I, I just pray that you'd bless them, Father, for that. Bless now this offering as we offer it to you, Father. May you be glorified in it. Will you multiply it as you did fishes and loaves? And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.